Hi guys, I'm back again today with uh, another reaction video. Today we're checking out the Quran and the secret of Babylon. Um, I think there's another version of this as well, but I don't remember. I think it's the secret of Egypt, I believe so. So if you want me to check that out, let me know down in the comments. And yeah, before we do start, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell button um this video is gonna be uploaded um a couple of weeks after i'm doing it and i think a video will be uploaded with that uh, we'll see how it works out <laughs> but you guys will see uh another video probably um uploaded within that same day or days after and also I'm not going to be resuming to normal reactions till probably like last week. No, no, no. April. So when you watch this, the next time I will do a reaction will be probably April. So that's why I'm kind of confused because of the time frame and the, the just everything is just confusing right now. But it will make sense on March. <laughs> I mean we are in Feb February right now as we are recording this. But anyways, before we start, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell button, and let's get it. I can't hear anything. Prophet Abraham oh. is a pivotal figure in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There's a lot of overlap in the stories about Abraham in the Quran and Bible. But it is only the Quran that reveals knowledge about ancient Babylonia that until recently has remained hidden from mankind, lost in time. Oh, this is the channel with a creepy intro. Jewish, Christian and Islamic sources all place Abraham's birthplace in ancient Babylonia, the region where we find modern day Iraq. This region oh, worship Abraham in my head. I don't know why for some reason I was thinking of Moses and then I was like, wait, um, wrong, <laughs> but it's Abraham. Okay, sorry. It's a multitude of gods and goddesses of particular prominence in the pantheon were celestial bodies such as the stars and planets. Each city had a patron god, which they worshipped as their main benefactor and protector. The moon god Nana, symbolized by the crescent, was worshipped mm. at Ur and Haran. Shamash, god of the sun, represented by the solar disk, was worshipped at Larsa and Sippar. Venus, personified as the goddess Ishtar, was symbolized by an eight-pointed star and worshipped at Uruk. According to Mesopotamian mythology, these three celestial bodies, the sun, the moon and Venus, formed an astral triad. Recent archaeological discoveries depict the special relationship between these deities. The stele of ur Namu shows the sun and moon joined together. The Koduru of King Melishipak depicts the astral triad in full. The Koduru of Nebuchadnezzar shows the astral triad. The stele of Nabonidus also depicts the astral triad. The wide geographic distribution of these artifacts indicates that this astral triad was a prominent cult throughout the region. The Quran informs us about some very specific details with regards to the idols that Abraham's people were.
worship of the sun, moon and a third idol. Note the details provided about the third idol. So when the night covered him, he saw a star. But when it set, he said, I like not those that disappear. The word translated here as star is the Arabic word kokab, which carries the meaning of celestial object and can be used to refer to a star or planet. The Quran tells us that at the onset of nightfall, this celestial object appeared for only a brief amount of time. This description of the third idol matches the characteristics of the goddess Ishtar. One of her names was the Evening Star because she personified Venus, a planet that appears for only a brief amount of time in the evening. We can see that the Quran's claims about the idolatry of Abraham's people is accurate in light of what we know historically about the cult of the astral triad. Amazingly, such knowledge of ancient Mesopotamian religion was lost for thousands of years. It was recorded at temple sites such as the famous Ziggurat of Ur, which was buried deep beneath the desert sands. The temple was only rediscovered in the early 20th century, thanks to the excavation efforts of archaeologists such as Sir Leonard Woolley. Even the Sumerian language that these ancient artefacts were written in was unknown. It became a dead language around the 1st century, forgotten until the mid-19th century. In light of these facts, how could Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, have accessed such knowledge, given that he lived in the 7th century? The only source of knowledge about Abraham that would have been readily available would have been the Bible-based stories and Jewish legends in circulation. If we examine the Bible, we find that it's silent on such details. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. We can see that it makes no mention of specific idols that were worshipped. They are simply referred to as other gods. Regarding the Jewish legends that predate the Quran, one of the stories found is as follows. And a voice came into his heart, saying, All the signs of the stars and the signs of the sun and moon are all under the Lord's control. While this account does reference the sun and moon, note how it mentions stars in the plural. Mm. We can see that Jewish legend has a general awareness of their worship of celestial objects, but it lacks the specifics of the astral triad in the Quran. In another Jewish legend about Abraham, we find mention of the worship of elemental gods. Behold, the fire is more worthy of honour than all things formed. But even more worthy of honour is the water, because it conquereth the fire. But even it I do not call God, because it is subjected to the earth. Nowhere does the Quran mention that Abraham's people worshipped the elements of fire, water or earth. Now if the Quran did copy from such an account, then it would have included the mention of these elements, but it never does. These examples make it apparent that Jewish legends were also not used as sources by the Quran. Now it's important to point out that some of the deities did spread outside the region. For example, Ishtar was also worshipped in Arabia. However, she took on very different characteristics. She became the male deity Aftar, representing the god of thunderstorms, symbolized as an antelope. In Egypt, she was Astarte, the goddess of war, symbolized by a horse and chariot. These incarnations are radically different to their counterpart, Ishtar, the evening star. We can see that Ishtar had a chameleon-like quality. Her identity was constantly evolving, with her attributes, symbolism and even gender differing from region to region. This would have made it difficult for Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to accurately pinpoint her identity in the context of Abraham. In conclusion, the Qur'an is filled with stories about past nations, with its author consistently demonstrating accurate knowledge of the unseen at different times and places in history. This is not a quality of human beings, but rather the divine. The Qur'an proclaims yep. that God Almighty himself revealed such knowledge. To learn more about the miracles of the Qur'an, please download your free copy of the book, The Eternal Challenge, at the link below. Oh, free copy. That's nice and interesting to kind of like see what is in there. 
um i think i've mentioned this like a billion times but these are my favorite types of like um content the comparisons the research so that is very interesting let me know what you guys thought i was gonna say request but you can still do requests down in the comments but it's not going to be looked at until first week of april so yeah thank you guys for joining if you like this video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up subscribe i'll see you in the next video bye